And uh, I'm going to read something to you. And then, uh, Lydia, if you want to throw that graphic up for me, that'll be great. So out of this book, I, when we wrote the book, the, the preface should have been chapter one. <laughs> but the preface actually should be chapter one, but it says preface. But here, I'll just read this first part to you. Let me just read this to you. Let, let me give you five simple statements that explains what revival is not. Revival is not spit fire, spit flying preaching, loud worship, or healing. Revival is not a sign posted in the front of the church announcing a week of extended meetings. Revival is not a famous evangelist preaching fiery messages on television. Revival is not repentance. Revival is not always comfortable. Now that we've determined some of the things that revival is not, let me give you some clarifying statements that will define what true revival is. Revival is the glory of God inv invading the space of the glory of man. Revival means change is inevitable and probably, uh, probably and probable to all that welcome it. Revival is an encounter with the power of God that changes you so deeply that it affects every area of your life. Revival is uncomfortable. Revival is controversial. Revival is usually offensive to the religious norm. Revival is vigorous life invading the half dead. Revival is, is, is the power of God breathing back into his people. Revival is often offensive, like a herd of swine running down a hill. Revival is thrown over the money tables in the sanctuary and restoring the temple of God once again. Revival is the savior of the world being born, birthed in a humble stable. Revival is a light to lost souls and restoring the transparency of believers. Revival is normal Christianity. Come on, amen? Amen. So kind of with that thought in mind, as you go into Galatians chapter 2, go with me to Galatians 2. So as you go to Galatians chapter 2, just glance up here at this graphic. And, and I put this together to kind of help, <clears throat> is in this graphic, you kind of see uh, the three parts of man, okay? So in the three parts of man, you have spirit, soul, and body, right? You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. The spirit man is connected to heaven, amen? The body part of man is connected to earth, right? And so... All three of the, these parts of you, everyone in this room, all three parts of these are in you and a part of you, and all three of them have a voice. The voice of your, fle or your body is your feelings. The voice of your soul is your mind. But the voice of your spirit is your conscience. The voice of your spirit is your conscience, right? So God begins to speak to your conscience. Now, if you don't know this, the word conscience is never mentioned in the first 39 books of the Bible. The Old Testament, never one time does it deal with conscience. Why? Because it was all religious form. All of it was religious form. And so God was preparing for the new covenant. All of that was preparation. Not until John chapter 8 does the conscience get mentioned ever. And then the New Testament speaks a lot about the conscience. There's about 10 different scriptures that talk about the conscience and and 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy talks about the conscience and your faith. Every time you see the word conscience, you always will see the word faith right next to it. Why? Because your faith doesn't work unless you're obedient to the conscience. Come on, right? So that's where we learn to be obedient. So we learn to be obedient to the conscience. Okay, so with all that in mind, Galatians chapter 2. So then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also to Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of the reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty. That we, may that we have in Christ, that they may bring us into bondage. Does that sound familiar? Right? 
to whom we also did not yield submission for even an hour that the truth of the gospel may be communicated to you. Now jump all the way down to verse 11. Then he says, Now when Peter had come, it says, to Antioch. So this is Antioch in Syria. So when the Bible talks about Antioch, there's two different cities in the, the, it, the, the, the Holy Land. There's Antioch in Syria, and there's Antioch in Pisidia. Okay, But in this case, he's talking about Antioch in Syria, which was the home base of the church for missions. Global missions was there in Antioch of Syria. So he says, Peter came to Antioch, and I withstood him to the face. And he says, because he was to be blamed. What was he to be blamed for, Paul? For before certain men came from James that would eat with the Gentiles, and when they came, they withdrew and separated himself, fearing those that were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. That's why eventually, in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas would have to separate ways. Why? Because Barnabas was swayed by this hypocrisy. Okay, then it goes on to say, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Uh, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. So he was talking about two, two different tables. So that's why I'm calling this tonight, the two tables. So there was the table of the Jews, and they weren't allowed to eat or be near the table of the Gentiles, right? So they weren't allowed to be near them. But Paul saw this. Now, both Paul and Peter obviously were Jews, but they realized the gospel was to the world, not to the Jewish people, but to the entire world. Come on, somebody. Amen? And so when uh, Paul saw Peter... Uh, some years after Pentecost, many years after Pentecost, he saw him falling into this hypocrisy of trying to make people go back to the Jewish law. He said, you're trying to sit at the table of the Gentiles and you're trying to sit at the table of the Jews. And we have the same thing today. Now, I preached some of this on God TV and it was banned forever because of what I said. Now, this is a prophetic picture of revival and seeker-sensitive dead religion church. That's what this is. There's two tables. Some have been touched by the flame of God, and they quickly run back to the table of religion. Is that right? They go back. They're like, yes, that was great. I got delivered of my bondage. Hallelujah. Now my devil is trimmed down to size. And now I'm going to go right back into the dead religion of which I came out of. And that is not an unheard of thing. That is a common thing. And I'm going to show it to you all over the scriptures. Go with me over to the book of uh, Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth. Y'all okay tonight? Man, you're quiet. <laughs> so Ruth. <laughs> Uh, Ruth, where art thou? Thank you. I was brought my new Bible with me. Joshua Judges Ruth. There you are. Ruth chapter 1. <clears throat> so in Ruth chapter 1, now watch this. Is this revival or what? Now it came to pass when the days of the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. There was a what? There was a famine in the land. Ah, And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, uh, who went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife had two sons. Now, the word Bethlehem, you know what it means? The house of bread. But in the house of bread, there was a, there was a famine. So in the house of bread, there was a famine. Ah, something is, something is wrong, right? Then the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. Now, the word Naomi, if you want to write this down, Naomi means my people. And the names of her two sons were Mahon and Chilion. Now, Mahon means this. It means sick. And Chilion means wasting away. So she named her two sons, literally in the Hebrew language, sick and wasting away. <laughs> sick and wasting away. Come to dinner now. 
Can you imagine that? So these were her sons, right? So, so this is their offspring, sick and wasting away. Is that religion or what? And then it goes on to say, Ephrates of Bethlehem and Judah, and they were came to the country of Moab, and they remained there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And now they took the wives of the women of Moab, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. Now the word Orpah means stiff-necked one. We would say hard-hearted. That's what we would say. Hard-hearted one. Stiff-necked. The name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And both Mahon and Chilion also died, and the women survived her two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law that she may return from the country of Moab. And she had heard of the uh, uh, children of Moab had uh, the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way and returned to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each with her mother's house, and the Lord dealt kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each to the house of her husband. And so she kissed them, and she lifted up her voice and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you and your people. Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Will you go with me? There are still sons, are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back. Uh, my daughters go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should bear you sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughter, for it grieves me very much for your sake and the, and the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed the mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now Orpah, is never heard of again. She kissed and she left town. She kissed and she left town. Ruth, on the other hand, would not just kiss and walk away, but Ruth would go and embrace Naomi and would eventually be the great, great, great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. <sighs> Come on, somebody. Amen. And so that's such a great prophetic picture. That is exactly what happens. So many people, they come to the river. They come to the anointing. They come for revival. That lives are totally changed. Like we were up in Canada in, in 19, uh, excuse me, 2006. We had a powerful revival in Toronto. And, and so this church in the city called Sarnia heard about it and invited us to come. And we ministered the first night we were there. We had six deaf people here in that first service. And so God was moving and the joy of the Lord hit and everybody was freaking out in this Assembly of God church. And, and so we went, we were supposed to be there three days and we were there for 13 months. And in that 13 months, it was like the Holy Ghost turned the fire up. And you know what? The fire doesn't cause uh, um, dissension or any of those different things, but it just reveals di it di or division it reveals the divisions that's been there all along. All revival does is pull the curtain back and says, hey, look what's, look what's already here anyway. <laughs> Come on, right? So revival doesn't bring the, distract, the, the, the uh, division. It just shows the division that's already there. Now go with me over to 1 Samuel. Okay, so 1 Samuel. Y'all still love me, right? All right. We already took the offering, right? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> So 1 Samuel chapter 10. So 1 Samuel 10. Could I ask you a favor? Could I get a bottle of water? Yeah. So 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil. Now you got to see this because otherwise it won't make sense. You're a blessing, brother. Thank you so much. So 1 Samuel chapter 10. This, you'll see the exact same thing as Ruth. The same thing as you see in the New Testament with Paul and Peter as well. So here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Samuel took what? A flask of oil. And he poured it on the head of Saul. Is that right? Then it goes on to say, and he kissed him and he said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Now, get this. It's a flask of oil. Meaning it is 
man-made. Man made this. This was man's choice. This was not God's choice. Is that right? The story of Samuel is he was anointed because God gave the people what they wanted. Is that right? In fact, the word Laodicea means give the people whatever they want. Did you know that? Laodicea, the, the church in Laodicea, it just means give the people whatever they want. Is that, I mean, is that the modern day church, right? So, so here, what do we see? It was a man-made flask. Now jump forward just six chapters to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, and the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? <laughs> Samuel's already moved on. <laughs> Don't mourn for Saul. He says, I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. And what does he say to the prophet? Fill your horn with oil. That's not man-made. That's God-made. Fill your horn with oil. Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending, ooh, I got goosebumps. I'm sending you to Jesse, the, the Bethlehemite. Uh, I've provided myself a king amongst his sons. Is that right? So God provided, God provided, and he had the prophet fill the horn with oil. The God-ordained one. Is that right? Okay. So that's what we see here. And so what do we know of these two? There were two different kingdoms. Is that right? There was a kingdom of Saul that was always in conflict with the kingdom of David. Is that right? And there was one dude that went between them. Anyone know his name? Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of King Saul. And so the Bible says that Jonathan's best friend was David. That's his best friend. He knows that God has anointed David to be king. He knows it. He knows his dad was never the first choice. Is that right? That wasn't God, excuse me, that was never God's choice. That was man's choice. He knows that, but he was running between two kingdoms all the time. When Saul would fight, David would run, excuse me, Jonathan would run to Jonathan's uh, to uh, Saul's camp. When the Holy Ghost is using David and, and the anointing was on David and he's worshiping God and the demons in Saul would quiet down, he would run over to David. And he would be friends with David. Is that right? And this is the exact same thing that we have in so many churches all over the country. We have people who are plugged into dead churches, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They should be just absolutely bulldozed <laughs> because it's an affront to God. Because it's not a reflection of heaven. It's a reflection of man-made religion. Is that right? Just like when Moses is coming out of the glory of God in the book of Exodus and he comes down the mountain, that the scripture says they went and they took their gold and they fashioned it with their hand into a golden calf. Is that right? And what do they tell Moses when he comes down the mountain? We just took our gold, threw it in the fire, and that's what came out. Is that right? They're big fat liars. They made their own religion. Are you with it? That's exactly what we got going on in our country. Listen, we're in 50 to 60 different churches every single year. We've already ministered in over 25 churches now at the end of April. So we're already way ahead of normally what we minister in this year. So we're, we're going from here. We go to Florida. We'll be in Lakeland. We'll be in Orlando. We'll be in uh, Riverview. And then we turn around. Then we go to Texas and we'll be in Houston and all of these different places. And I can't tell you of one after another where we've had the fire of God fall. And they go right back to it. We were in, in just north of Denver. I'll never forget it. Oh, man, we had a powerful revival set of meetings. This church heard about us because of the Sarnia, Ontario revival. And we were in charisma from it. And so anyway, so they saw the charisma article. They invited us. So we came and Holy Ghost hit that place like a bomb. Uh, two of the people that were there, they were both drug addicts. Power of God hit them both. Uh, the wife got healed of a stomach disorder. The husband got delivered of drugs. And, and both of them laying on the floor, flopping and laughing all afternoon from the morning all the way to the night. And fire of God, every single service, seven days. And we ended up leaving. 
And I got a phone call from this couple that their whole life, they laid down drugs and everything, and they called us up, and they're like, our pastor stood up that next Sunday and said, all right, the fun and games are over. Let's get back to what we were doing before. And this couple said, I'll go right back to drugs. <laughs> because it's just exactly like the gathering demoniac. You know, can you imagine? Here's Jesus. He goes over by boat to the other side of the sea in Mark chapter 5. And he sees the gathering demoniac. And the Bible says he cries out. He's cutting himself, trying to kill himself and stuff. And all these demons come out of him, right? And the pigs and all of that stuff. And the Bible says he's seated, clothed in his right mind. And the Bible says, and the city said, would you please leave, Jesus? So the, the end wasn't, woohoo, we got the demonized guy free. They liked him better with devils. Come on, somebody. Religion likes them better with devils than set free. They just want to trim their devils down to size. They want their devils. They just don't want to completely get rid of them. They just want it more manageable. Are you with me? And that's where the majority of people are, and they don't realize. They're like, yeah, let's have revival. What they mean is, let's have more people. I want to preach to more people, and I want to uh, have a bigger voice in the state, in the nation, And but I'm not going to change anything. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's so asinine that it's not even funny. You know? And I'll, I'll just tell you of my own story. So in, I shared a little bit of it, but I got saved in 82. 1982, I got radically saved. The power of God came on me in the middle of the street. I didn't know what it was. My friends didn't even know what it was. They were baby Christians. I could feel God's power. Four months later, I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Two years later, I'm in Bible school. Two years later, I'm in the ministry. And, and so here I am, I'm, I'm just going for God and all of this. And I was a, a pastor in, 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 in New Jersey for several years and then in, in California for two. And, and so in the midst of it, as a pastor, I felt more like a fireman than a pastor. Just being honest. Turn the music up, turn the music down, make it hotter, make it colder, make it longer, make it shorter. You know, most churches. <laughs> you understand? And so I was so wore out from just trying to keep people happy. Come on, somebody. In 1996, rolls around, and, and, and uh, one of uh, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown's associates ministered to me, and I got hit with the joy of the Lord. I was like Jonathan. I just thought, oh, this is nice. <laughs> this is joy. Let's just have joy. Let's just all giggle. Let's just all laugh. Let's fall on the floor. But yet, let's keep doing the, the kingdom of Saul. Let's have Saul's kingdom, but with a little bit more fun. Come on, somebody, right? That's what I thought. I, I, that's what I thought. So two years goes by. I'm living in Tulsa. True story. And a revival breaks out in the state of Minnesota. And I was living in Tulsa. And I had ministered in this church in Roseville, Minnesota, many times. And the pastor told me, he said, we were so hungry for God, we emptied the church's bank account and the building fund, and we flew the whole church to Pensacola for one month. We paid the whole church. We're either going to have revival or we're shutting down. That's what he did. So they had about 150 people or something like that. And the fire of God just hit them. They literally stayed there for 30 days in Pensacola, every service, 30 consecutive days. They came back and revival just hit that church like a bomb. And uh, so long story short, I went and I was scheduled to minister there. And so on the way, driving up here to Minnesota from Tulsa, it's about an 11-hour drive. I was driving up. I went and I stopped by the Christian bookstore and I picked up uh, a brand new worship album. And it was just called Brownsville Worship 2. I thought, hey, that sounds good. I like Lindell's worship. So I get it, and I put the, song, the, the, the cassette in, and the second song on the album is called, There Must Be More. And when I heard the words of that song, Lord, I groan, Lord, I kneel, I'm crying out for something real, because in my soul, I know there must be more. And I started hearing that, brother, I started weeping in, the, in my van driving to Minnesota. This is... 
February of 1998. Okay? So I get up here. I get to the church. As I get to the church, I they had told me that they had prayer teams and stuff. That's kind of how they had learned it down there. Whatever. No problem. So they had these prayer teams and stuff. So I get to the church at 6 o'clock. So I get there for the 7 o'clock service. It's a few minutes to 6. And I get, get uh, to the church. And the whole church is in the altar praying. So 180 people are in the altar praying, interceding. And so I went over to one of the ushers. I said, oh, did, did you guys already start service or something? He goes, no. Friday nights, we take off work early to come and pray for the visitors for one hour before service. I said, in all my years of ministry, I've never even heard of such a thing. Everybody takes off work. Everybody. He said, we are one body. Everybody takes off to pray not for themselves, but for those who are going to come that night to experience the fire of God. Come on, somebody. Amen. And I'm like, this is crazy. And so we began to worship. We worshiped for about an hour and a half. I mean, everybody was just wrung out like a rag. Now, I was living at the time in Tulsa. Kenneth Hagin Jr. was my pastor. Now, let me back up. Two weeks before, on a Wednesday night, I was there at church, 7,000 people. And as, as I'm in Tulsa on a, a Wednesday night, he gets up to preach and he stops and he looks at me. And, you know, if somebody looks at you from the pulpit too much, you're like, I got to check my zipper here a second. You know, you know you're like, why is, he, why is he looking at me? He's kind of creeping me out here. What's the deal? And, uh, and so I, I, I'm looking around and I realize he's looking at me. And so he says, this is a young evangelist in our church. So he says, Tom Scarella, come down here to the front. He said, the Lord says your whole ministry is going to change within the next two weeks. I didn't know what that meant. And so two weeks later, fast forward. So I'm driving to Minnesota. I get to the church and I remember the prophecy. And as I walk into the church and we're worshiping with all of our hearts that night, get up and I preach and stuff. And it comes time to pray <clears throat> at the end of the message. So I go to pray. And when I shut my eyes, phew, I get sucked into a vision. I left my body. Phew, I got sucked into this vision. And I'm at the Mount of Transfiguration. And I mean, I could smell it. I could feel the dirt, everything. I'm there. And, I'm, and then I look up, and there's Jesus. And instead of Moses and Elijah, I see Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland. And he says, you gave a place in your heart to these men I never told you to do. And he takes them both away, and he says, this is my son, and hear him. And shoo, I come back into my body, and I'm shaking uncontrollably. And now the vision changes, and I'm in the altar, and they're praying for me. I'm like, hello? <laughs> hello? You know I came 11 hours. Here. You know I'm the evangelist, right? You know that, don't you? you know? I'm like, this, what, is the, what is the problem here? You know? And so anyways, long story short, I close my eyes. I go back into the vision. I'm in the altar. I open my eyes, I'm out of the vision. I close my eyes, whew, I'm back in the altar, and they're laying hands on me. So I leaned over to the pastor, I said, listen, this is really bizarre, but I said, I'm supposed to get in the altar and get prayer ministry. So he says to me, ah, no problem, Tom, no one will think anything. The prayer team will pray for you too. So they come to lay hands on me, they don't even touch me. And by the time they touch me, the fire of God hits me. Now back then I had a, a, a full suit on. And as I had this full suit on, fire of God hits me, and I start weeping and shaking so hard. I start crying so hard until I had a nosebleed down the front of my suit. I shook and cried for four consecutive days as the fire of God burned through my body. I couldn't stop crying. I told the pastor the next night, I can't preach. I can't, I, I can't do anything in your church. I said, you got to do it. You got to preach. I can't preach. He goes, no, this happened to all of us when we went to Pensacola. You'll be fine. It'll lift for you to preach, and then it'll hit you again. I'm like, oh, lovely, you know? And so and so, so I literally would preach, and then I would turn around, I'd get in the altar, and I would just weep. It. I mean, I was weeping uncontrollably. I remember I went to the Mall of America. I'm thinking, if I go to the Mall of America, this will stop during the day, you know? So the, the third day I go to the Mall of America, I'm walking through the Mall of America crying my guts out. People must have thought I was suicidal, but I was really being healed. I mean, God was touching me, but everything was changing. It was just like God was having a, 
a rummage sale. Throw that crap out. That's a bunch of junk. That's a bunch of religion. That's a bunch of attitude. There's, there, there, there's, there's a bunch of pride. Might as well throw that out, you know. <laughs> I felt like I was gutted by the Holy Spirit after four days, you know. And, and everyone we would minister to, the same thing would happen to them. Fire God hit them. They'd start weeping uncontrollably. It didn't matter where we went, anywhere uh, in the world. 1998. Many people don't know this, but in 1997, did you know that in America, almost 4,000 revivals were documented? Did you know that? Almost 4,000 revivals. 12 months later, there wasn't even 300 left. Was God done? Man was done. They were kissing and running back to religion, right? Because once they realize this is not about what they want, they, they want to be Jonathan. They want to run between two kingdoms. We want, hey, we want, yeah, we want a little bit of joy and a little bit of fire, you know, like our friend in Norway. A little bit of joy. A little bit of joy and a little bit of falling down. And we can have two or three people, you know, all get hit with the joy at once. Oh, that would be lovely. And then we could go right back to the programs and everything that we've always done and never change anything. Amen. And so, but yet revival is about changing everything. Charles Finney said 150 years ago, he said, when revival hit, he said, I was the one crying the hardest. And he said that I was not only the one crying the hardest, but he said this is he said that uh, the fire of God would hit all kinds of different people. Just the more that we would allow the fire to touch us, we could touch others. He went on to say that Isaiah could minister with fire because he was touched with fire. Many people are trying to touch with fire, and they've never, they've never even smelled smoke. <laughs> Come on, right? Amen. And yet so many places. I mean, I could tell you all over Minnesota. I could tell you of Mankato. I could tell you of all kinds of different places and in, in, in all over the Twin Cities or all over the state of Minnesota where we've had great revivals, God doing great things. And they're like, that was nice. It's kind of like a sandwich. Like, that was a nice ham sandwich. Now we're going to go back to the old of, you know, doing everything the way it was before. Instead of saying, this is going to change everything. Come on, somebody. I went home after those four days with the fire of God, and I'm telling you what, I went through my books, and I said, that's crap. Throw that away. That's a bunch of fluff. That's nothing in that. I literally went through, and I, I gutted my entire library of things that didn't carry the fire of God. Come on, somebody. Amen. And everyone will tell you, everyone in Tulsa will still tell you to this day, they saw a visible difference. It wasn't I fell down and just stood up. Come on, somebody. So some people, you know, we've gone to some churches where they fall down. They're, they're, they think that's the end all be all. Oh, people fell out. Well, if you fall down a jerk and you get up a jerk, then what the heck? You're still a jerk. I mean, what the heck? You're still a jerk. So who cares if you fell down? Did you get up changed? When Paul fell down, he said, man, I got to change my name. I can't be Saul anymore. I got to change it. I'm different. Saul was a self-serving person that wanted to be elevated. Paul, did you know the word Paul means? Little. Little in his own eyes. It's such a change on the inside of him there on the Damascus Road. Amen? Everyone say change. Hallelujah. I remember we were ministering, we were ministering in Fresno, California. And the fire of God hit this place. And man, people were just weeping all over the place. And this one dude was in the altar. I mean, he was screaming and crying. And as he's weeping and screaming and crying out to God on the altar, two, three people got up and they start petting him because they felt bad for him. And I said, I said in the microphone, I didn't even care. It was a camp meeting. I said, look at there. Somebody repents and the church doesn't know what to do with it. They treat him like a Labrador retriever. Come on, somebody. Absolutely drives me crazy. I see it almost every single month. We just came from California. People were falling down, shaking. One lady was weeping. One was laughing. And so somebody came over and started petting her. Oh, Jesus. Here they're trying to do something soulish to something that's spiritual that's taking place. Come on, somebody. 
It's a soulish thing that people call spiritual. Are you with me? I said, don't touch her. She's in the spirit. You're in the flesh. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. So what about Judas? What happened to Judas? Judas was in the same meetings. I said, Judas was in the same meetings. Judas saw blind eyes heal. Uh, come on. He saw the Gadarene demoniac heal. He saw Jesus walking on water. But after three and a half years, he sold out for what? Sack of money. Sack of silver. Is that right? He sold out after three and a half years. Why? He got bored. I said he got bored. And he not only got bored, he got distracted. He not only got distracted, he got familiar. Seeing Jesus do the miraculous. <sighs> All right. When's the offering? Come on, let's get the offering going here. Right? Because Judas was distracted. He was so distracted. That's why the end of Judas is such a horrible thing. Here he missed the opportunity of planting churches all over the world and impacting the world. And he sold out for that little bag of gold. How many times and how many places have we gone and we've seen churches that have sold out? Why? Because what happens is, is this. When revival comes, the first thing that it attacks is it attacks comfort. When Jesus came and he called Andrew and Peter, you know where they lived? In a city called Capernaum. Anyone know what Capernaum means in Greek? It means this, the village of comfort. And the Bible says, drop what you're doing, come follow me. And he commanded them to leave comfort. So the first thing that revival does is it calls you out of comfort. <laughs> come on, amen? So it calls you out of the land of comfort. Yeah, I, you know, Pastor David, going with you guys, winning souls on the street, man, that's not comfortable. You know, God, if God, if God wanted me to do something, you know, he's not going to make me uncomfortable. Hello. Let him die and let him follow me, Jesus said. Is that right? Is that true? Right? And that's all a part of it, right? The second thing is this. I call it Christian communism. Christian communism. What is Christian communism? It's really, you know what it is? It's really nothing but hippies. It's a hippie spirit that's come back into the church. And what it does is, is it says, you're a pastor. You're none better than me. You're a pastor. You're none better than me. You're not an elder to me. You're nothing. You can't correct me. You can't change me. I'm a rebel on my own. Come on, somebody, right? You cannot disciple me. You can't correct me. All you can do is encourage me. Otherwise, I'll go to church XYZ. Is that right? You cannot today. Why? Because of the, the powdered pews of America are so accustomed to just one diet. And it's only one thing. Oh, if it's not about love. Hey, did you know that God is not just love? God is a lot of different things. The Bible says he's holy. <laughs> God is just. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. He's not the love spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Is that right? So part of being in revival is change. Part of revival is change. Part of revival is being corrected. Amen? And I believe that God is calling all of us to heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, and all of that different stuff. But at the same time, God has put gifts in the church. I receive people as a gift. I hear a man of God preach or a woman of God preach. I'm like, sister, I'm locked in. Go for it. I'm, I've never heard what you're going to share. But some people are like, oh, I already know that verse. Come on. Is that right? Familiarity breeds contempt. And they miss the move of God because of it. I mean, we've had over 2,000 lame and crippled people rise and walk out of canes, crutches, wheelchairs. We used to decorate our offices with them. And every time anyone will tell you, Joe's known me for over 20 years, anyone will tell you in our meetings, we see someone healed of a headache. We cry. We rejoice. We clap. We hug them just like we've never seen one. <laughs> Come on, right? We were in New Prague there with my brother. We were over there, and, and we had this person healed. It was, you know, like their foot. <laughs> so someone came up to me afterwards. They're like, we were in a meeting. We saw you lay hands on three deaf people here. That was a lot greater than this. I said, yeah, but 
I treat it like I've never seen it before. When the preacher gets up, I even say to myself, I've never heard what he's going to share. Last night when he was preaching, and tomorrow night when he preaches, I tell myself, I stir my Listen, I'm in church more than all you guys put together. You understand? I'm in over 300 services a year. You understand? So I stir myself up. I mean, the moment that the, the man or woman of God takes a, you know, they read a scripture. Wow. <laughs> Jesus fed 5,000. What the heck? That's wild. <laughs> Come on. Why? Because it keeps it real and innocent in me. I want to keep it real. I want to keep it real. I didn't lay down the world to follow some stupid religion. I didn't lay down the world to follow some half-baked, half-dead religion. Come on, somebody, say something in the house. Amen? I came for the real, genuine thing. That's I came for the real power of God. Amen? 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 I'm telling you, my wife will tell you, I sit in front of YouTube and I start crying like a baby, watching the sick get healed, and I'm like, man, that was awesome. I sat here watching these people on this video, and I'm like, oh, God, I got to preach. Holy cow. I'm going to get messed up here. Amen? Because I have to check my heart. Amen? I was just talking to a pastor up in the Fergus Falls area uh, just before our service, and, and we were talking about some of these things, and, and that, you know, in the church, we have this individualistic mindset. The only problem is that's a Greek mindset. That's not a Hebrew mindset. You have, in, how many of you got a Bible? Raise your hand. Anyone got a Bible? Oh, okay. So there's 66 books. 64 of them are written by Jews. <laughs> there's a little slant. You understand what I'm saying? 64 books written by Jews. Hello. So it's not going to be Americanized. Why? Because it's an Eastern mindset. What is the Eastern mindset? The Eastern mindset is very similar to the Latino mindset. What is that? It's group mentality. It's a group. We're a body. We're a body. Just like I, I was just telling this pastor up north. I just said to them just, just earlier tonight, I said this. How many churches did Paul say, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? How many churches? One church. He didn't say that to all 26, you know, 29 books or 20, whatever, 26 uh, books of the New Testament. Come on, somebody. Is that right? He said it to one church. But you know what he said before that? He said, no one partnered with me but you guys. He said, no one sowed to me like you guys. And then he ends chapter 4 at the end, one of the last things Paul ever said. Now, because it's hit your heart, because of that, my God will supply your need. He didn't say that to the Colossian church. Come on, somebody. It wasn't to all you guys, hippie hanging out in Philippi, any Christian who's ever prayed the sinner's prayer. No, no, no. It was to the group. It was to the group that were connected. Come on, somebody. Why? Because as we as a group connect and we rub with each other, you get irritated. Oh, don't look so holy at me. We take missions teams with us to Vegas every year, every November. We'd love to take you guys with us to Vegas if you're interested. We'll just sign up on our email list and we'll take, give you all the details for Vegas. But we go for three days and we heal the sick, cast out demons, win souls, the whole nine yards all over Vegas. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's crazy. Drug addicts, drug dealers, prostitutes, people, human trafficked, you name it, they all get saved and delivered and stuff for three days. And uh, so, and, and we go and we have to live together. <laughs> We're in the same vicinity. And people are like, I don't like that person. You know, they don't brush their teeth very good. <laughs> well, good. It's teaching you to love somebody who smells. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. So what is it doing? It's changing you. You're learning to walk in love. You're learning to love those who aren't very lovely. Is that right? So it does something. It does. It changes you. It's supposed to bring change in you, right? That's what a community does, like your church in, in Wilmer, Pastor. You know, people get around each other, you know, and, and it's easy on when you only got two hours on a Sunday. But if you're together on multiple services, 
man, some people just bug you. Does that guy know he's singing off tune? Holy crap. It's just like chalkboard stuff. I mean, I'm just like, oh, I mean, just bring it up just a little bit, brother. And you're on. Come on, somebody, right? But what is it? God's doing something. He's changing something on the inside of you. Is that right? All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost deals with you about volunteering. My, my wife has got an amazing story. My wife grew up in church here in Minnesota. She's a Minnesota girl, and she grew up in church. And when she was 11, her parents divorced and devastated her, and, and her dad was a leader in the church and told the kids that God told him to run off and marry someone else. And how many of you know that wasn't God? And my wife backslid for many, many years, for about 10 years. And she was working here in the cities <clears throat> at this tanning salon. And as she was, um, she went and, and had, it was actually planning her 21st birthday of getting just sloshed so that she could go get drunk. Just being honest with you, that's what she was doing, right? <clears throat> so she was in the world, right? Four days before, she's at the coffee shop and a woman who just got saved didn't know how to evangelize and she looked at my wife and she said susie you know you and i are pretty similar you know we're both kind of grew up here and south of the river and all of this her parents are similar and she goes the only difference is and she picks up her coffee and she says if i die i'd go to heaven if you died you'd split hell wide open <laughs> and she walked off never i mean that that's what she did my wife was furious she couldn't work all day long. She, she was so mad. She was like, I wanted to smash my computer. And, and at the end of the day, she went home to her apartment and she said, I was so mad of eight hours of conviction. She said, I slung my purse across the floor and I said, all right, God, if you're real, I'll give my life to you. She fell on her knees. She said, I'll give my life to you. Just don't do something stupid like send me to Africa. Guess where she was 12 months later? on a four-month mission trip to Tanzania with the Maasai people. <laughs> Come on, is that awesome, huh? Then she got involved in this church south of the river. So she was going to this church, you know, a couple years. She's on fire and born again and spirit-filled, and, and all of a sudden there was a big church fight over something stupid. And she got devastated. And she got so devastated that she went and she was just so broken by what took place that she got thrown in the midst of it and she backslid hard. And she began to backslide. And a lady at work that she worked with said, I just came back from a powerful revival in Smithton, Missouri, a town of 532 people that had 900,000 visitors in nine years in a town of 500 in a town of 500, 900,000 visitors in nine years. That's a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> you understand? 900,000 visitors in nine years. It's got to be a revival. You understand? And so it's crazy. And so she said, her best friend said, I paid your way to go with me. You're going with me to revival for four days. Susie goes, I'm not trying to go to more church. I'm trying to go to less church. And so she said, I'm not going to more, I'm going to less. And so uh, the woman said, well, your way is paid. So Susie said, all right, I'll just go with you. And so they brought her there and she took one step over that threshold and the power of God hit her. And she fell out under the power, weeping and shaking uncontrollably for about three days. The fire of God was burning in her. She called her mom from uh, 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 Smithton, Missouri and said, I'm moving to Smithton, Missouri. And her family went and told her, you don't move for church. She goes, I am, because the fire is here. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And so she literally moved her life, and she began to tell. She began to tell me this. She said, I went to that church for seven and a half years, and I missed one service. Now, we're not talking about once a week. You've been there, Joe. We're talking five days a week. Services that started 7 and finish at 2 a.m. And she missed one, one time when her grandmother died. That was the only time she missed church. Come on, somebody. Are we really ready to sacrifice? Come on, somebody. Amen.
and her whole life changed. She began to tell me, she said, you know, Tom, she said, when at the revival, you had to go and you had to hit every service for two years, and then you might be able to clean toilets. That's a true story. Two years and you might be able to clean toilets. Amen? But I believe this is that there's something on the inside of us all that want to see the fire of God. Come on, somebody. Not just fall down, shake, get up, the same jerk we fell down. <laughs> Not the same addicted person, the same person with the same attitudes. Come on, somebody. So revival is not about you falling down and shaking, giggling, or even weeping. Revival is about change. It's about where God does something so huge on the inside of you, it literally changes everything in your life. Your whole life begins to change. Amen. That's true revival. True revival is where you go, and yes, you'll probably fall down. Yes, you'll probably laugh. Yes, those things. But also at the same time, it'll bring a humility to you. Come on, somebody. <laughs> is that right? Amen. It'll, it'll bring humility. It'll just cost you everything. <laughs> Amen. It'll cost you time. You're going and, and, and you know, ministry and sacrifice and you don't want to win souls. You don't want to go and knock on doors. Come on, somebody. Your flesh doesn't want to do anything but sleep and eat and go to the toilet and watch your favorite series. Are you with me? And at the end of it, now you got to watch another series. Is that right? I'm telling you, never are you going to get to eternity. And God says, did you watch this series? Did you see this on Netflix? This was absolutely, you, you didn't say, oh, hey, everybody, come on. We got to just, we got to watch this together. Hold on. Said, We're going to take you through the whole series now. Come on, somebody. Never in your eternity will that be the case. Come on, somebody. Amen. But all of a sudden, just imagine the sacrifice, people with sacrifice. Right now, there are people in Iran and Iraq that are born again. And for having one page of the Bible, they get their head cut off. Their families, you know. There, there was a series on YouTube that was taken down, I don't know how many times. It was called Wolves in Sheep, Clo uh, Sheep in Wolves Clothing. That's what it's called, Sheep in Wolves Clothing. And... This series was taken out. It still might be on there. I don't know. Somebody keeps trying to post it and stuff. And it's about the Christians in the Muslim world. And there was a husband and a wife that were pastors. And they had led people to Christ. The wife had been, been um, raped multiple times by the Muslim community for preaching Christ. Multiple times. Her children, the one child was killed in front of her face. The husband was beaten. They had ripped all of his fingernails out and his toenails out and stuff. And they loved it. They loved it to just sacrifice for Christ. One day there was an opportunity to move to Canada. And they moved to Canada. And up in Canada, they were in this church one day. And the people kept saying, what time does this get over? And the wife looked at the husband and said, I want to go back to the Muslim world. I felt the presence of God closer because this is not real. This is not kingdom normal. Kingdom normal is sacrifice. Right. Come on, somebody. Amen. Right. And they went back there and they were both killed. They were both killed for the gospel. But she said, I'm happy. I'd rather be there than rot with the frozen chosen right here. And I'm telling you, I believe that God is raising up a people that sacrifice will be their middle name. Come on, somebody. So it's not about, you know, you giving up, you know, giving an, oh, yes, about an offering. Hey, these people aren't give, just giving an offering. They're giving their lives. They let their children be murdered right in front of their eyes for the gospel, and they wouldn't shut up. We, we have churches all over Minnesota that wouldn't stay open because the governor said it's, it's not safe. How wicked is that? And these people are getting their fingernails ripped out. And their wives are being raped in front of the whole village. I'm, I'm telling you. I, 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 it's just, I, I believe that there's got to come a wake-up call to our nation. That this, this whole watching the clock thing and everything is about self. And if it's not comfortable, it's not God. Where is that in the Bible? <laughs> that is like so anti-God. It's absolutely wicked. You know what it is? It's Jonathan 
who loves the blessing of David, but he wants to really die with Saul. And that's where he died. You look at the end of Jonathan's life. He didn't die with David and his mighty men in this great kingdom. We don't call it today, 4,000 years later, we don't call it the kingdom of Saul. What do we call it? Kingdom of David. We don't call it the star of Saul. We call it the star of David. We don't call, you know, Matthew chapter 1 doesn't say the offspring of, of Saul. It says the offspring of David. And so Jonathan becomes just a, a vapor, just like Orpah. She kissed and she ran, right? And why? Because sacrifice was too much. She didn't want to sacrifice. Is that right? The same thing with Paul to Peter's face and Barnabas. Paul said, I will not stand for it. So from Acts chapter 10, we don't hear from Barnabas ever again. You never hear about Barnabas after Acts chapter 11. Excuse me. After Acts chapter 11, you don't hear about him again. Or chapter 13. Excuse me. I was wrong. Chapter 13. You don't hear from him again. Why? Because he was trying to go between the Jews, the table of the Jews, and the table of the Gentile. So I believe this, that we have a choice tonight. We have a choice to say, I'm going for revival. <laughs> I don't care what it does to my flesh. And I'm here for the others. Just like that church in Roseville when they had that revival. They said, we all sacrifice Friday night. We sacrifice. We sacrifice me time. We sacrifice supper. And we sacrifice for revival in our city. Come on, somebody. But we have such a, a Greek mentality of I'm an individual. I, you know what? I'd really like to go see. You know, I, I really want to feed my goldfish tonight. You know, my cat is on suicide watch. There was a cat that killed itself. And so there's a, you know, there's a, there's something wrong in my neighbor. I probably should be. That's what God would want. God would want me. You know, I had, we were ministering in California. This is a true story. And we were, I was greeting people as they were leaving. And this lady comes up to me and she said, that was awesome this morning, man. God spoke to me. I said, that's great. Are you coming tonight? And she said, well, Lord willing. <laughs> I said, do you think God's saying, whoa? You got way too much church. I want you staying at home watching another Netflix. Come on, somebody. I mean, how dumb can you get and still breathe? So you know what I told her? I said, I know God's willing. He's not the one in question. <laughs> He's not the one I'm wondering about. It's you. <laughs> Is that right? Come on, amen. Now, I know it doesn't pan out well in the powdered pews of America. I know that. And, but at some point, we have to raise up an army. Could you imagine an army? Can you imagine someone in the army say, whoa, do we have to get up at dawn? Come on, Sarge. Come on, come on, come on. I, real, you know, I know that the president would want me to have my sleep. <laughs> That's part of my identity, you know? <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? You can't have an army like that. Guess what? If we truly are in the army of God, then we do it for the group. Now, there's a thousand things I could have preached today. I could have preached something. We'd all be shouting, jumping, running around the pews and stuff. But I prayed tonight, and God said that he said, I'm doing something special in, 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 in Hutchison. And I'm raising up a revival people that will raise up a revival culture that will break the norm that will break religion, that will break the golden calf of religion in the rest of Hutchison or the rest of Minnesota. Others won't go for it. You let them kiss and go back to the old. Let them run like Jonathan between the two kingdoms. Oh, we want to get blessed. Let's get us some joy at, you know, let's get some joy at Pastor David's church. Okay, now we're going to go back and live like hell. We're going to shack up with the devil, but we're going to just once in a while run over and kiss Jesus just a little bit. He's my, we're his girlfriend, not his bride. We want to be able to see other people. But we're called the bride of Christ, meaning we're betrothed to one. We're betrothed to one. And I believe he deserves it. And some people are going to be shocked at the sacrifice in heaven of many. Amen. Many people. I remember Rick Joyner writing a book called The Vision, and he was talking about, in, in The Vision, he had gone to heaven, and he was shocked. He was shocked. 
at major ministries that he thought would be at the forefront. He said they were so far in the back. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Why? Because those who had sacrificed, those who were last, now were first. <sighs> Come on, amen. And I believe that the Lord sees every sacrifice, you know? I'm telling you, the Lord began to speak to me in the early days of revival. The Lord said, I was shocked. One day I'm driving and I'm listening to worship. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the Lord said, you're addicted to entertainment. I'm like, what the heck? And he said, what do you do when you wake up? You put on music. What do you do with first thing when you get in the car? Well, come on, talk to me. Don't look so holy. Some of you are like, oh, I have no idea what in the world he's talking about. Right? He said, it's an addiction. And he said, because you don't like quiet. Is that right? You don't like quiet. you got to have noise all the time. Because you don't want to be quiet with your own thoughts. And I'm like, holy cow. I mean, this is the Spirit of God is moving on me. I remember this one time, this guy, this other minister, you guys don't know who he is. Uh, he, uh, uh, he just didn't like me. It was just a real bad situation. How many of you had someone didn't like you? Come on, raise your hand. Okay. Praise God, I don't feel so bad. Okay, this dude, he was a minister and he didn't like me and he ripped me and my wife for two hours one time, called us everything you can imagine and stuff. And, and so we just, you know, we went and blocked his number and <laughs> we blocked him on Facebook and all of this stuff. And two years goes by and I have a dream. Man, I hated that dream. <laughs> I had this dream and I heard Jesus behind me. This is what he said in the dream. He said this. <laughs> it gives me goosebumps still. In the, dream, in the dream, Jesus said this. If your brother is angry with you or upset with you, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother. Listen, I didn't make that one up. Okay? I, told, I woke up. My wife said you sat straight up in bed and you went, oh, crap. And my wife said, What? I said, oh, I said, I have to call Pastor so-and-so. She goes, we've had two years apiece. You're not calling him. And I said, I have to go and repent to him. She goes, but why? You didn't do anything. And I said, God doesn't care. God doesn't care who's right. Because he's all about relationship. So he didn't care who was right. I was, it didn't matter if I was right. Who cares? God didn't care. He wanted me to be reconciled because he's part of the body. Come on, somebody. So guess what? I had to humble myself. I called him. I told my wife, go on out of the room because this is going to get loud. And she walked, she walked, she touched, grabbed the door, and he answered. And for 45 minutes, he called me and, you know, this and that and uh, all of this stuff. He was just, you know, you're a racist and you're this and you think you're better than everybody. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. For 45 minutes. Sorry, non-ending. And I didn't do anything. But the Lord didn't care because of the change that it would bring in me. Would you put that music on for me quietly? So <clears throat> at the end of it, I hung up the phone. I blessed him, honored him, hung up the phone. And as I did that, it was like I felt like in the spirit, like I got a smiley face on my paper. <laughs> I, can't, I can't explain it, but it felt like I got a smiley face, you know? So tonight, Lord, you're good. <laughs> I went long tonight, forgive me. But Lord, tonight, we thank you. Lord, we live right now in the time of two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms. There are two tables. There's a kingdom of revival and fire, and anointing, and power, and miracles, and signs, and wonders, and the whole gospel. And there's the table in the kingdom of religion that has no power, but it's a facade of godliness. And we have a choice. We could serve one or the other, or we can be like Jonathan, running between the two, asking just for a sprinkle, just, just, salt our church with revival but i believe this is that god is raising up a people in hutch that says we're sold out to one table 
we're going to burn the other table. And so we're not going back. And uh, so, Lord, right now, tonight, I thank you right now. There are people here right now. Lord, there are things in their heart. There are things in their lives. I'm telling you, I prophesy to you tonight that some of you came tonight with some big stuff, some heavy-duty junk. Some of you have got some addictions and stuff, and some of you have got some major issues. You can clap to the songs and stuff, but God sees all. And the Lord's not angry. The Lord loves you. He loves you so much. He wants to just, by His presence, by His fire, He wants to just burn it out of you and set the captives free. Some people are just caught in a web of depression. Some people are caught in a web of of anger and they can't see anything but anger it's just it's just everything is angry and everything is bitter and some people you know all kinds of different things some people are are doing stuff they don't want to do they don't want to do it they're like captive to the enemy but tonight i'm telling you the fire of god is here to set you free the fire of god is here to set you free tonight just lift your hands right now spirit of god just turn it up just fill the house 